A well-developed chest makes a powerful difference in the appearance of your physique. But what range of exercises do you need to maximally develop the chest? Today we'll be cutting through the noise and confusion that's forever present on the web through dissecting the latest science behind chest hypertrophy. Regular viewers will know we've had a previous video on chest hypertrophy. You don't need to watch that video as the key points will be mentioned here. But crucially, this video builds on that and will dive deep into how you can develop all regions of the pecs. We'll be mentioning virtually every chest exercise ever, from pressing motions at different inclines, with different modalities, with different grip widths and hand positions, and isolation pec exercises. Welcome to the House of Hypertrophy. Technically speaking, a few muscles belong to the chest, but we're focusing on the largest and most important one for aesthetics, the pectoralis major. Anatomical analyses commonly consider the pectoralis major to have a clavicular and sternocostal head, although quite fascinatingly, the sternocostal head has been divided up to as much as seven segments. Based on one analysis, the clavicular head makes up 19% of the pectoralis major volume, with the remaining 81% attributable to the sternocostal head. Some well-controlled electromyographic research, which actually considered six regions, finds they can be functionally separable. What this means is it's theoretically possible to preferentially target different pec regions. This is not bro science. For simplicity, we'll just consider there to be three regions, and I'll refer to them as the upper, middle, and lower pecs. Let us now dive into our analysis, starting with the middle pecs. As shown in this classic 1997 paper, the middle pecs have tremendous leverage for shoulder horizontal flexion, with the front delt behind. In this case, Leverage specifically refers to the muscle's moment arm, which is the perpendicular distance between the line of force of the muscle and the center of the joint it moves. Promising data suggests leverage is perhaps the most important factor behind how the central nervous system chooses which muscles to activate in an exercise. Considering this, it's unsurprising that well-controlled electromyographic research finds that a significant chunk of the pecs including the middle region, is active in shoulder horizontal flexion. Now, we will be mentioning electromyographic research throughout this video. It's where researchers use electrodes to record the electrical activity of a muscle. Regular House of Hypertrophy viewers will know it's not flawless, but I believe well-controlled and specific electromyographic studies possess the potential to give us valuable insights. The pinned comment and description contains more details about this if you're interested. Anyhow, we also know the middle pecs are stretched well at the initial position of shoulder horizontal flexion. Thus, shoulder horizontal flexion motions can attain a nice stretch plus high contracting forces from the middle pecs, two things that make an exercise excellent for hypertrophy. Your first thought may be that all fly exercise variations do this. Indeed, this is true. However, these are isolation exercises. They will be dissected later in this video. Right now, we'll focus on horizontal pressing exercises, which involve all bench pressing variations, including with the barbell, dumbbell, smith machine, and machine. Also, push-ups and seated machine chest presses fit into this category. All of these are compound exercises, when you're pressing with a moderate to wider grip, they tend to involve shoulder horizontal flexion. Ignoring the lower arm reveals this. Therefore, it's unsurprising that this paper found just flat barbell bench pressing three times a week across six months grew the middle pecs by an impressive 37%. Does this mean the flat barbell bench press is superior? No, because as detailed in our previous video, we have a range of scientific papers that actually suggest all these variations can probably be quite similar to the barbell bench press. Machine variations have been documented to produce similar pec growth and activity to barbells. Dumbbells tend to evoke similar pec activity to barbells, and push-ups have even produced similar pec growth to barbell benching. Now, 
Some of you may be wondering about dips. This doesn't actually involve shoulder horizontal flexion, at least not predominantly, but we'll discuss this more in the lower pec section. Anyway, the fact all these exercises are likely similar for pec growth may come as a surprise to some, but remember that at the end of the day, although subtle differences exist, they all fundamentally involve shoulder horizontal flexion. Provided we're training them hard and getting too or near to failure, we're going to be exposing the pecs to high tension. It is also fascinating to know the scientific literature implies there's a strong strength carryover between all these exercises. Training with a machine chest press has been shown to significantly increase barbell bench press strength. The inverse of this is also true. Training the Smith machine bench press has also been shown to significantly increase barbell bench press strength. The inverse of this is also true. There's fairly strong correlations between push-up performance and bench press performance, as well as dumbbell and barbell benching, so you're free to select whichever exercise you prefer. Although, there are actually five considerations you may factor into helping you choose. The first consideration relates to push-ups. Since push-ups replicate a plank position, they likely engage the rectus abdominis more than all the other variations. Since push-ups also enable scapular protraction, they likely engage the serratus anterior better than all the other variations. Depending on your goals, this may make the push-up a better or worse option. Although, progressively overloading the push-up in the long term can be difficult. Yet, despite the popular belief that 8-15 to 15 reps or some other narrow rep range is ideal for hypertrophy. We've mentioned countless times at the House of Hypertrophy that reps between 6 to 35 are similarly effective for building muscle, provided these reps are performed to or close to failure. Thus, progressing to higher rep push-ups is viable. Indeed, we've had a great paper that found increasing the number of reps you perform with the same load across training sessions produced overall similar muscle hypertrophy to another group that increased load within the same rep range across sessions. Now, there is only so much you can add reps. Going well beyond 35 reps may be inferior, yet, provided you're not super advanced, weighted push-ups are a great option that enables load increases. The second consideration relates to dumbbell bench pressing. When analyzing them, the triceps are likely trained slightly less compared to all other variations. The likely reason for this is you can't apply much lateral forces during a dumbbell bench press. Doing so would just result in the dumbbells falling either side of you. This matters as the triceps are involved in generating lateral forces. With all the other variations, lateral forces naturally occur whether you know it or not. Indeed, Electromyographic data finds reduced triceps activity with a dumbbell compared to a barbell bench press. Depending on your goals, this may make it a better or worse option. The third consideration relates to failure and fatigue with the barbell. With failure, we've seen previously at the House of Hypertrophy that getting to or close to failure is needed to maximize muscle fiber recruitment and tension, two things crucial for maximal growth. In fact, we have research on the pecs illustrating this. This paper had trained individuals train the Smith machine barbell bench press with a maximal lifting velocity. There were four groups. One group literally performed one rep per set. A second group performed their reps until their rep velocity slowed down by 15%, another by 30%, and a final group by 50%. Pectoralis major hypertrophy was best with the group that trained closest to failure, that is, the group whose reps slowed down by 50%. Extrapolating from other research, a 50% velocity loss equates to performing 70-80% to of the maximum number of reps possible on average. This study didn't have a condition training to actual failure, but as we've seen previously at the House of Hypertrophy, Getting 3 to 1 reps from failure seems to produce similar growth to failure, so this is the general recommendation. Here's the thing, with a free weight barbell bench press, you're putting yourself in the safest position by having a spotter and or a safety setup that saves you if you fail a repetition. If you don't have these, the other options may be a safer bet. The second point stems from this fascinating fatigue paper. It had trained men either perform the smith machine, dumbbell or barbell bench press. 
Chest fatigue, swelling, and soreness were quite comparable between all these three exercises across 96 hours after training. As a side note, this is further indirect evidence all these variations impose a similar pec stimulus. The triceps fatigue was not too different between groups, except the dumbbell group saw lower fatigue and soreness, which makes sense as we've just detailed how triceps activity is likely reduced with the dumbbells. Nonetheless, the main point is despite the fact all these fatigue measures were largely similar between the three exercises, subject's subjective recovery was worse across the 96 hours after training with the barbell versus the smith machine and dumbbell. Thus, these findings might suggest your own perception of recovery may be a bit worse with the barbell. Yet, I don't believe this is super crucial information. Fatigue isn't necessarily bad. Plus, your body does produce adaptations across time that reduces the fatigue you experience. So it's entirely likely that any fatigue from the barbell variation is inconsequential in the majority of circumstances. The fourth consideration surrounds machines. We've briefly alluded to how there's data comparing machine to barbell pressing and similar pec hypertrophy was found. This might surprise some because there's been speculations that extra stability with machines better enables muscle fiber recruitment. However, I think stability is critical on the extreme ends. For example, bench pressing on a Swiss ball is probably going to suck for building muscle, but the extra stability with machines compared to barbells and dumbbells doesn't seem to transfer to greater growth. Plus, we have meta-analyses, which combine the results of numerous studies, finding that overall, machine exercises largely produce similar growth to barbells and dumbbells. Now, not all machines in the world are identical, but provided the machine provides solid resistance at the bottom where the pecs are stretched, it should be good. Some machines can converge to get a better shortened and contracted position and perhaps provide a solid challenge here. Dumbbells also involve convergence. This is extra shoulder horizontal flexion near that shortened position and this convergence and squeeze can feel nice. Despite this, it probably doesn't enhance growth since the available data suggests tension at that shortened position may not provide extra benefits. Specifically, we have three studies remarkably finding that a partial range of motion at the lengthened position produces overall better hypertrophy than a full range of motion. This seems to tell us that that shortened position, which is reached with a full range of motion, doesn't stimulate extra growth. Instead, we're seeing better growth with more time spent at that lengthened position. We also have research finding isometric training at longer muscle positions produces more growth than shorter muscle positions. Now, more data with other exercises and demographics are certainly needed to validate this general concept and the effectiveness of partials at long lengths. But in the absence of other data, it seems high tension around the lengthened position is what's more important. Linked to this is our fifth and final consideration of this section, stretch. Let me first describe some fascinating research, and then we'll fit this into how you might enhance your pet growth. Besides this data demonstrating that time accumulated at the lengthened position seems to be more anabolic, we have data demonstrating selecting exercises that reach a better stretch could build more muscle. For example, seated leg curls better stretch out the hamstrings than lying leg curls, and have been documented to cause 1.5 times more hamstring hypertrophy. Moreover, it is seriously intriguing to know that a recent study established performing this intense pec stretch produced notable pec growth. In fact, the growth was similar to that obtained to another group of subjects that trained the machine chest fly with these variables. Of course, achieving a stretch during weightlifting is far from identical to holding an intense stretch for a prolonged duration, and I don't anticipate many people actually want to start holding intense prolonged stretches. Regardless, I think this is further illustration of stretching stimuli having positive influence on growth. So what could this information mean for pec training? Floor presses are a variation I've yet to touch on. This limits the extent to which you lower and thus lengthen the pecs, so are likely suboptimal for growth. This doesn't mean no one should ever do them. They could have application if your goal is maximum strength, or if you're dealing with some kind of injury or discomfort that means you can't train the pecs at a more stretched position. Anyhow, 
The key point of this stretch talk is we have variations that can help us reach a deeper pec stretch. Dumbbells technically permit you to reach a deeper stretch of the pecs. Thus, although we've alluded to electromyographic data showing similar pec activity between dumbbells and barbells, one pitfall of electromyography is it doesn't measure stretch-based forces. So it is actually possible out of all the variations we mentioned, dumbbells truly could be slightly better. Although, larger dumbbells can make this challenging to achieve. And this brings us to two other variations, the cambered bar bench press and deficit push-up. Both of these similarly enable a greater stretch of the pecs. Thus, although we don't have direct research on them currently, it's possible these variations could be slightly better for building the pecs. To be as scientifically accurate as possible, we must not neglect that virtually all the studies on the benefits of training muscles with more stretch has been conducted on previously untrained individuals and lasted no more than 12 weeks. I mention this as there have been speculations that the extra growth from training muscles and more stretch positions is a special type of growth that plateaus quickly. If true, this suggests training at more stretched positions will just produce similar gains to training at more shortened positions after the extra growth plateaus. However, this is based on limited and indirect data. Moreover, there is some data that suggests there still could be long-term growth benefits to training muscles at more stretched positions, but this too is from limited and indirect data. For those who are interested in the weeds of this, I thoroughly dissect the current science and deliver my thoughts on this topic at this link. Regardless, I still think training muscles at stretched positions in practice is worthwhile. Even if those extra gains plateau, we still want them. Moreover, the best case scenario is there's still long-term gains to be seen from them. This doesn't mean no one should ever have training focused at shorter lengths. We've seen that although the overall growth is less, training at shorter muscle lengths still stimulates growth. So know that you can still certainly grow from it. Additionally, a technical consideration is that with all else equal, training at shorter muscle positions generates less fatigue than training at longer muscle lengths. For example, with all else equal, floor presses likely generate less fatigue than regular bench pressing. In theory, this means you can probably train more with exercises at shorter muscle lengths, and this extra volume, although not time efficient, might go some way to closing the muscle growth gap between shorter and longer length training. Summarizing this section, we've seen that a range of horizontal presses are likely all similarly effective for growing the pecs, including the middle pecs. Thus, you have the freedom to select whatever you prefer. Here are five considerations that may factor into your choice. Of course, it is also not outside the realm of possibility to construct a sensibly varied program that involves more than one of these horizontal pressing variations. Remember that we'll be dissecting isolation exercises later on, but let us now transition to the upper pecs. Well-developed upper pecs can take your physique to the next level. We've already described a plethora of horizontal pressing exercises at your disposal for developing the middle pecs, but how effective are these for the upper pecs? Earlier we noted this paper that found flat barbell bench pressing grew the middle pecs by 37%. What I didn't mention was the researchers also found that upper pecs grew by a very similar 36%. Another Australian paper found flat barbell bench pressing grew the middle pecs by 10% and the upper pecs by a not too far off 7.4%. Note, the percentages are lower in this paper as the subjects were already trained, the study was shorter in duration and a slightly different size measurement was taken. Nevertheless, these papers clearly show horizontal pressing will contribute to growing your upper pecs. But does this mean we don't need any dedicated upper pec work? The answer is no. Let me explain why. In both these papers, instead of looking at the growth in percentages, if we look at actual centimeter increases, the upper pecs actually grew fairly less than the middle pecs. How on earth could this be? It's because the upper pecs were smaller in size to begin with. A smaller number to begin with 
but sees the same or similar percentage increase to a larger number still means a smaller total increase in size. Resultantly, it is technically accurate to say flat barbell bench pressing grows the upper pecs less than the middle pecs. Now, this data is from the flat barbell bench press, but we know there's reason to believe this applies to all the horizontal pressing exercises on the table. Indeed, machine and even weighted push-up variations have been documented to elicit similar upper pec activity to the flat barbell bench press. Consequently, to maximize upper pec growth, we likely need an exercise to preferentially train the upper pecs. How can this be done? Well-controlled electromyographic research finds that the ratio of upper pec to middle pec activity is better when the force is directed obliquely upward instead of purely horizontally. Inclined bench pressing replicates this, at least insofar as pushing in an upward direction. Indeed, out of the seven studies that have explored this, inclined bench pressing produced greater upper pec activity compared to the flat barbell bench press in five of them. It is also notable that the majority find middle and lower pec activity is reduced with the incline and front delt activity is higher with the incline. There's occasionally debates on the optimal incline angle for targeting the upper pecs. What does the current literature say? One paper found a 30 degree incline was ideal, another found it was a 44 degree incline. While we even have data finding similar upper pec activity between a 30 and 45 degree incline, besides the possibility of the limitations with electromyography measures, individual differences could be in play. People don't have identical muscle architecture or leverages, nor do people have an identical bench press setup. So the ideal incline angle may differ between people. So if you would like to incline bench press and your bench is adjustable, feel free to experiment around. It's worth noting incline bench pressing can also be done with a Smith machine, dumbbells and a cambered bar. And we've alluded to how the extra stretch with a latter two might confer some extra growth. Moreover, feet elevated push-ups and certain machine chest presses where you push upwards likely effectively hit the upper pecs. Although, one caveat with feet elevated push-ups is your head tends to limit how much you can lower yourself, resulting in a reduced pec stretch. Using some boxes or handles to increase depth can go some way to alleviate the shortcoming though. So all of these options likely preferentially target the upper pecs, but there are actually some more, perhaps underappreciated ways the upper pecs could be targeted. Out of all the pec regions, the upper pecs have the best leverage for performing shoulder flexion, and well-controlled electromyographic analyses find the upper pecs contribute more to shoulder flexion than the other regions. During horizontal presses, using a closer grip gets you closer to predominantly performing shoulder flexion. This is best achieved when keeping the arms near to the side and not flared out. Also, using a reverse grip on a barbell also forces you into performing shoulder flexion, regardless of the grip used. We might speculate these preferentially target the upper pecs, yet the data is somewhat split. Since out of the eight papers comparing close to moderate and wider grip bench pressing, four of them find upper pec activity is better with a closer grip. Out of the two papers comparing reverse grip bench pressing to normal grip bench pressing, only one finds enhanced upper pec activity. As an additional note, the majority of data finds closer grips better recruit the triceps. When comparing these variations to an incline bench press with a wider grip, we just have this paper that found upper pec activity was not statistically different between a closer grip bench press and an incline with a wider grip, although the raw numbers lean toward the closer grip. Regardless, this might be tentative evidence closer grips could be as good for the upper pecs as a standard incline. We shouldn't forget that closer grips and reverse grips can even be used with the Smith machine, dumbbells, and even push-ups. So, there is a fair number of potential upper pec options. We'll provide some recommendations in a second. I say this because we're not quite done. It's possible for us to use a closer or reverse grip on an inclined ankle. Could this be the best? The only analysis from the literature is this paper. 
that found compared to an incline bench press with a wider grip, an incline with a closer and reverse grip produced non-statistically different upper pec activity. Although, the raw numbers lean towards using closer and reverse grips on the incline. However, it's worth mentioning this paper was the same one that found flat closer grip bench pressing produced upper pec activity levels that were not statistically different from the incline with a wider grip. Anyhow, we'll add closer and reverse grips with an incline to our already extensive list. The landmine press and lying svent press are two final exercises worth mentioning. The landmine press involves pushing in an upward direction that we know likely preferentially targets the upper pecs. However, the very close hand spacing reduces the overall stretch of the pecs. Thus, I suspect it's not going to be as good as all the other options mentioned. But it's certainly not a bad exercise and it will still build muscle. So if someone really likes it, that can be enough of a reason to train with it. As for the lying Svend press, it's essentially a close grip press with an intense chest squeeze against the plate. The size of the plate means the stretch is restricted, and since there's only so heavy of a plate you can lift, it's going to be difficult to progress this exercise in the long term. Dumbbells can be used, but this still suffers from a restricted stretch. The only scenario where I think someone may want to perform this is simply if they find it a fun and enjoyable addition to their training. So we know there's a ton of upper pec options. What's the recommendation? We've seen there is essentially evidence for all of these variations better targeting the upper pecs, and in the limited data that has compared some of these, there are non-significant differences. Thus, for now, I'd simply recommend selecting whatever option you like. Although it is possible what works best could differ between people, for example, Greg Knuckles from Stronger by Science notes his upper pecs get outrageously sore from flat reverse benching, whereas this never happens from his incline experience. Thus, you could experiment with any of the variations and evaluate how they subjectively score for you. Do you perceive more upper pec with them? Is the pump and perhaps the next day soreness in the upper pecs greater than usual? Now, it's critical to understand subjective sensations are not yet validated proxies for actual muscle activation, and we also know despite popular belief, the intracellular events associated with a pump and soreness do not appear to be strong drivers of hypertrophy. But having said this, I believe it's still plausible when controlling as much factors. Subjective sensations like the pump and soreness could be indirect insights to the actual tension seen by a muscle region. So in the absence of anything else, I think it's not the end of the world for you to try and use your subjective perception to help determine what you may train with. Earlier, we described evidence that the different regions of the pecs can function somewhat independently, and that includes the lower pec regions. For instance, when the arms are nearly overhead, performing a shoulder extension contraction preferentially recruits the lower pecs. But is dedicated training for the lower pecs essential? Recall we've seen data demonstrating that flat barbell bench press highly develops the middle pec region, but the upper pec region, in absolute terms, grows less. As for the lower pecs, both these papers found it grew pretty similarly to the middle pec region, both in percentages and centimeters. Therefore, it appears flat barbell bench pressing is highly effective for the lower pecs. I'm presuming this extends to all the other horizontal pressing exercises. So dedicated lower pec training may not be essential. Whatever horizontal presses you have could cover you. Of course, this does not mean no one should ever perform specific movements for the lower pecs. Perhaps you're constructing a program with sensible variation that means an exercise that biases the lower pecs can fit into your program. Or alternatively, if you somehow find your lower pecs are underdeveloped despite training with your choice of horizontal presses, then dedicated training for your lower pecs may be called for. So how might the lower pecs be preferentially trained? The lower pec fibers run in this direction, and it's possible movements that align with this and press downwards could preferentially train the lower pec area above the other regions, such as decline bench pressing, machine decline pressing, hands elevated push-ups, dips, 
and isolation exercises that we'll cover in the isolation section. Quite fascinatingly, two electromyographic studies that have compared a 15 degree decline to a flat barbell bench press found lower pec activity was similar between them. In addition to these two papers, there have been a few other electromyographic papers exploring activity of the other pec regions between a decline and flat barbell bench press. The findings are a little mixed, but some of them suggest that upper and middle pecs, as well as the front delts, display lower activity with the decline. Therefore, although actual lower pec activity may not be that different between a decline and flat angle, since middle and lower pecs display lower activity in some analyses, a decline may fundamentally still be considered a valid way to selectively train the lower pecs over the other regions. As for the dip, it has the capacity to attain a great stretch. Unfortunately, there is no officially published research comparing dips to other common chest exercises. I know this paper compared pec activity between different dips, with the ring and normal dips producing decent upper pec activity. Not much comparative conclusions can be made from this, and they didn't assess the middle or lower pecs. Besides this, all we have is this unofficial electromyographic analysis that found during a weighted dip, raw lower pec activity was better than the upper and middle regions. At the end of the day, feel free to try out any of these movements. Your subjective perception may guide your choice. We can say as an overall muscle, shoulder horizontal flexion is the motion that best trains it. Isolated shoulder horizontal flexion occurs with flies, including cable, machine and dumbbell flies. Before comparing them, could these pec isolation exercises grow the pecs better than the compound exercises we've talked about? When comparing isolation to the compound movements, there's no movement at their elbow, meaning we're taking the triceps out of the equation. You might guess this means our central nervous system can better activate our pecs with the isolation exercises, and thereby produce greater pec hypertrophy versus compound exercises. Despite being logical, the available data does not support this. We know that dumbbell flies are most challenging at the lower parts, and during this phase, Two papers find pec activity was comparable to that of the flat barbell bench press. Although, one of the analyses found if we look at average activity across the whole exercise, the bench press actually evoked higher pec activity. This was largely because the activity at the top portions was better with the bench press. I don't believe this means bench pressing is a superior pec builder, because we've already detailed how it currently seems extra activity and more shortened and contracted positions doesn't cause extra growth. Another analysis found both front delt and pec activity was similar between a barbell bench press and machine chest fly. As the authors concluded, the results clash with the idea that isolation exercises promote greater activity of the prime movers due to isolation. Due to this, I'd say isolation exercises are likely not essential for substantially growing the pecs over the long term. Compound exercises, such as your choice of horizontal pressing and an upper chest bias compound movement, is likely going to be sufficient for seeing substantial pec hypertrophy in the long term. Does this mean no one should ever perform isolated pec training? Not at all. It is absolutely possible to construct a sensibly varied program that includes compound and isolation exercises for the pecs. As a simple illustration, you may have a flat bench press, inclined bench press, and cable fly. Not entirely disconnected from this, perhaps you deem you have sufficient amounts of triceps training in your program, but you want to train the pecs more without additional tricep stimuli. In this case, isolated pec training is the perfect solution. Finally, I also don't want to rule out the possibility of individual differences. Averages have been detailed throughout this video, including the finding that pec activity is not so different between compound and isolation movements. Yet, it's within the realm of possibility for some people. Much of the compound exercises detailed in this video, regardless of how they perform it, just predominantly taxes their triceps, and much less the pecs. In fact, some research, albeit having a few notable limitations, points to this. Thus, isolated pec training might be needed for these people to truly stimulate their pecs better. With these reasons out of the way, 
How can we most effectively isolate the pecs? When looking at cable flies, starting with the cables in line with the arms, these will provide a greater challenge in their shorter muscle positions. This isn't terrible. Muscle growth will still occur from shortened positions. Also, remember with all else equal, shortened training likely generates less fatigue. Accordingly, if we want an isolation exercise that generates lower fatigue but will still provide a fair stimulus, this variation is an ideal contender. But assuming your recovery is all good, we know challenging muscles near a more lengthened position is likely a great idea. Having a setup with a cable somewhat behind your body better challenges that lengthened position. They can also be performed laying down. Besides this, dumbbell flies and machine flies successfully load the pecs near that stretched position. There are two variations of machine flies. There are subtle differences between them, but I don't anticipate they are meaningful enough to impact growth. Some people think this fly better stretches the pecs because the arms are straighter. But remember, since the pecs attach to the upper arms, not the lower arm, the degree of arm bend doesn't really influence the pec stretch. And assuming we're roughly extending the upper arm comparably between the two movements, the stretch is not going to be too dissimilar. So, I believe we can be confident all of these variations can be highly effective. You might contend since cables and machines additionally provide solid tension near the contracted position, that makes them better than the dumbbell variation. But as you know we've mentioned a few times here, the present literature implies extra tension at the shortened position may not deliver extra growth. Others might contend due to the inherent freedom with cables and dumbbells, an even greater stretch is available for those who can comfortably get there. Assuming this deeper stretch is beneficial for growth, this could indeed give them an ever slight edge. Now, there is widespread controversy around the deep stretch in flies and with wider grip benching being injurious. Here's my two cents on this. Much of these ideas stem from hypotheses and anecdotal observations, which suffer from multiple potential confounders. The scientific literature at present has low quality and minimal insight into injury risks from various chest movements. Of course, absence of evidence isn't evidence of absence, so it would be misleading for me to make any definitive conclusions until we have higher quality investigations. For now, I'd simply recommend performing your exercises in a manner you're comfortable with. A handy feature with cables is its height adjustability. Low cable flies involve flying in the upwards direction. The direction we know likely preferentially targets the upper pecs. Resultantly, this is yet another option available to better train this region. If you're not feeling it with all the previously mentioned compound movements and or you just want to take the triceps out of the equation, low cable flies are a solid solution. There are also inclined machine flies. I believe we can presume they should be highly effective. Inclined dumbbell flies can also be done, but an important point is since gravity pulls the dumbbells down and you're at an incline, your shoulders are likely going to be working overtime to keep the dumbbells out to their side. For this reason, I suspect these aren't going to be as potent for the upper pecs. Regarding the lower pecs, high cable flies as well as decline dumbbell flies better align the flying direction with that of the lower pec fibers. So both of these might potentially preferentially hit this region. The final isolation exercise we'll discuss are the controversial freeway pullovers. Specifically, there are fierce debates about if this exercise is a better chest or lat builder. What does the current scientific literature suggest? Pullovers involve shoulder extension, and freeweight pullovers are virtually exclusively challenging at the top position. At this top position, the lats have much lower leverage compared to lower elevation angles, while the middle and lower pecs likely have some leverage for shoulder extension at these higher elevation angles. Indeed, well-controlled electromyographic papers find during isometric shoulder extension contractions at different elevation angles. The lats display their lowest activity at the highest elevation angle, while the pecs display fairly good activity at this region. Moreover, recordings directly from a barbell pullover find the pecs, particularly the middle and lower regions, display higher activity than the lats. However, 
I'm not completely sold this means their lats are minimally stimulated. I detailed why in our ultimate guide to lat hypertrophy, but I'll mention the key points here. Although the pecs are stretched in the overhead position, the lats are also stretched quite well. We have research finding even if a muscle has lower leverage and displays reduced activity, the muscle can still grow well provided it's at a longer length. For example, the gluteus maximus is lengthened more with deeper squats, but they have lower leverage and activity in this position. Yet, we have research comparing 90 degree to 140 degree knee flexion squats and the 140 degree deeper squats grew the gluteus maximus quite a bit more. So in total, I'd say there's evidence that both the lats and pecs may be trained fairly well with free weight pullovers. Now, some people report feeling it more in their lats instead of the chest, while others report the inverse. Ultimately, what we need and what I'm looking forward to is research directly measuring lats and pec growth after free weight pullovers. I guess it's not implausible that it could differ between people, but for now, since we have some data suggesting the pecs display fair activity, you could try this exercise out if it appeals to you and examine your perception. So we've detailed a ton of information, and I understand it can be tricky and very challenging to construct your own muscle building program. But the Alpha Progression app, which is essentially your personal clever muscle building assistant in the palm of your hand, can easily help you. With hundreds of thousands of downloads, thousands of reviews speak to its unmatched quality. Other apps truly generate garbage programs, but this app intelligently gets you closer to your dream physique through generating an evidence-based program 100% customizable to your needs. Simply let it know all about you your experience level, the equipment you have, how often and how long you can train for, and if you want to focus or neglect certain muscles. This can all take less than a minute, and you can still make further edits if you like. The app has extra impressive features. During workouts, the app's algorithm carefully suggests how you may progressive overload to help push you to the next level. Aesthetic graphs automatically display your long-term progress and there is a huge exercise database of all the best muscle building exercises, with crisp videos and instructions behind many of the exercises detailed in this video. Try out every single one of the premium features to your heart's desire during a free two-week trial through the link in the comments and description. If you like it and choose to go beyond, the link cuts the price of a subscription by 20%. I truly believe the app is exceptional, and I hope you'll enjoy it too. To ensure this video details every single relevant study relating to pec hypertrophy, there is one final study that needs to be mentioned. 47 previously untrained men trained either the incline bench press only, flat bench press only, or a combination of both with these variables. After training once per week for 8 weeks, the incline bench press group tended to see the best upper, middle, and lower pectoralis major growth compared to the other groups. In other words, just training an incline bench press led to the best results, with flat bench pressing or even a combination of both leading to inferior results. You may be thinking, what on earth? Doesn't this go against much of what was described in the rest of this video? This is indeed true. You may also be thinking, since this paper directly measured pet growth, we should consider it as high quality evidence. This is typically true, but upon scrutinizing this paper further, there's reason to be skeptical. The pet growth seen in this paper was simply outrageous. The incline group increased their pec thickness by 54 to 62%, and the other group still saw more than 40% growth for some regions. In fact, if we scale to average gains per workout, we find that pec size increased by 4.6% each workout. Imagine that your pecs increasing nearly 5% after each training session. And remember this is the average in the study, we're not talking about an outlier subject. If we compare the average growth in this study to the rest of the research that has measured pec hypertrophy, we can see just how striking the difference is. Also, remember this study just involved 8 training sessions, while the rest of the research involved an average of 33 training sessions. This only further makes things more perplexing. So what gives? 
Although this is speculative, I believe the strongest explanation is that hypertrophy measurements might just have been faulty. 47 subjects completed the study. The text implies the researchers should have measured the gains of all 47 subjects, but just 30 subjects actually made up the hypertrophy measurements, so 17 measurements were missing. The researchers did not explain why, but it's entirely possible errors were made with these 17 measurements, perhaps suggesting the researchers poorly conducted the hypertrophy measurements with the ultrasound machinery. If this is all true, there could still be something dubious with the 30 measurements, perhaps explaining these abnormally astonishing amounts of hypertrophy. In addition to these confusing gains, we can't ignore the fact these results conflict with multiple other papers. The study did find upper pec growth was better with the incline, which is what we'd expect. But the fact the incline group grew the middle and lower pecs more conflicts with the findings of reduced middle and lower pec activity with an incline. We know this is EMG data, but there are multiple of them. And well-controlled electromyographic data also finds the middle pecs display lower activity when force is directed obliquely upwards compared to horizontally. Finally, we also have this paper that found the incline bench press produced a lower mid pec pump to the flat bench press. Again, the intracellular events associated with a pump do not seem to strongly promote hypertrophy, but when potential confounders are controlled, the pump may be an indirect insight into the tension seen by a muscle region. Although, this paper also found the upper pec pump was similar between the flat and incline bench press, which I'd say is somewhat of an odd finding as well. Nevertheless, for all these reasons, I don't believe we can derive recommendations from this study. Before summarizing things, what about targeting the inner and outer pecs? At the time of constructing this video, there's no research comparing inner and outer region growth between different pec exercises, so this is why we don't have a section on this. However, I don't anticipate this is a major problem. Based on the advice in this video, the pecs will probably grow well across its length. In fact, one study alludes to this. Trained individuals perform the flat and inclined barbell bench press, and we've alluded to how this is a perfectly fine and simple combination for pet growth. One group actually held a stretch between sets, while another rested passively. The stretch between sets didn't enhance gains, as both groups saw similar growth. But the key point here is the magnitude of growth at the middle and outer portions was pretty much identical. The researchers didn't measure the innermost region, but I'd be surprised if it didn't grow at least fairly. I will say if any future research does come along about the inner and outer regions, I'll be sure to update you all. Until then, it's not worth worrying about. On to the summary. There is no must-do or best pec exercise. Rather, there's evidence a ton of exercises can be highly effective. There's also no one programming style that's unanimously the best. Instead, there are multiple paths you could take. Specifically, we've seen it's likely substantial pec hypertrophy can be attained purely through training with compound exercises, but we know there are reasons for adding isolation pec exercises. When exploring compound exercises, horizontal presses are excellent for the pecs, and we have research suggesting all these variations can probably be similarly effective. Although, there are five reasons you might consider, and one of them is that the deeper pec stretch from dumbbells, a cambered bar, and deficit push-ups might make them slightly better. The current literature seems to imply these horizontal presses likely grow the middle and lower pecs very well, but the upper pecs somewhat less. To train the upper pecs more, all of these are potentially great options. In the limited data comparing some of these, there are non-significant differences in upper pec activity. As for the lower pecs, although dedicated training for this region is probably not essential, here are potential options available to you if you would like to train this region more. Finally, here are isolation pec options on the table, and we described how all of these are potentially largely similarly effective. If you're after isolation options to better target the upper pecs, these are some great potential options. And if you're after isolation options to better target the lower pecs, these are some great potential options. 
Thank you for watching. Feel free to check out the Alpha Progression app or our recent deep dive into building the LEDs.